Uh, welcome to this World Economic Forum a session jointly developed with uh, East Hai Media Group. Uh, my name is Yang Yanqing. It's my uh, great pleasure to uh, moderate this session. And our uh, uh, focus today is China's capital market. Uh, uh, before we begin the session, a very um, uh, friendly housekeeping reminder that if you want to share the sessions through a social channel, uh, you should use the hashtag WEF20. And we all know that China has advanced to open up its financial markets in the last few years by uh, encouraging higher foreign stakes and also uh, even wealthy. Uh, at the same time, expanding cross-border investments through QFI, RQFI, uh, Stock Connect, and also Bond Connect, and other uh, different types of the schemes, which has been highlighted in the uh, recent signed China and the United States uh, trade agreement. But more importantly, uh, all this reform agenda has been uh, on China's uh, uh, roadmap to the future. Uh, which will benefit China's financial and also economic strengths enormously in the long run. So our focus today will be uh, what does a more open and more international uh, Chinese financial markets <coughs> mean for the uh, domestic players and also mean the uh, international players uh, in the rest of the world. So um, we have a, a wonderful uh, panel today here. And uh, next to me, uh, Mr. Sergio, uh, Ermotti, uh, he is the group uh, CEO of the UBS. Uh, he also on the International Business Council of the uh, World Economic Forum. And next to him, uh, Mr. Fang Xinghai, he's the vice chairman of the uh, CSRC, China Security Regulatory Commission of, the, uh, of China. And also uh, next to, to him, uh, Madame Carmen Reinhardt, a very famous uh, uh, economic professor in the uh, international financial system of the Harvard Kennedy School of the, uh, uh, of the government in the, in the United States. And uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Zhang Yichen, he's the chairman of the, uh, uh, and chairman and also CEO of the CIDIC capital of Hong Kong, uh, SAR in China. So, um, we, have, we will focus on uh, the opening up of the uh, uh, China's financial market. And it seems to me there are two uh, aspects of the opening up to uh, the China's financial market. The first one is the institution. And China has encouraged a, uh, a higher uh, share from the, uh, uh, from the international investors uh, for a while. And also the timetable has been, uh, has been uh, ahead of the ahead of schedule from time to time, so which is very good news to the in, in international uh, investors. But I also uh, talked with quite some of these kind of uh, uh, international institutions, and they also um, very much eager to have a, a bigger room, also a big contribution to China's market. But it's interesting that after almost two decades of the opening up of the China financial markets to the foreign is, uh, institutions, and they, their share in China's market is still very low. It's almost a, 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 a two or three percent, uh, which is a, a very, very low compared to international standards. So my first question I want to um, uh, uh, direct it to uh, Chairman uh, Xinhai. Why, um, why do you think that after so many times of the opening up, they only have a so small share of the, uh, of the market power. So what kind of the uh, opening up and a regulatory framework we should have to support them to have a bigger role in China? You know, the, uh, our, our purpose is not to uh, increase the market share of foreign players in China, right? We want to you know, uh, level the so-called level the playing field, so uh, high quality foreign players can do a bigger uh, business inside China. And one of the key uh, decisions that we took uh, last year, which will be implemented starting from April uh, the 1st this year, is to allow the foreign uh, companies like you know, uh, Sergio's company to own 100% of their operations yeah. in China. And that should remove uh, you know, a lot of restrictions uh, for the foreign uh, companies. So going forward, uh, you know, foreign companies, I, I expect their share in the China business to increase, but again, they have to compete. Yeah, that's true. But at the same time, uh, yeah, they are eager to compete in the, um, 
in a fair and good way. In terms of the, if they are the uh, institution in China, uh, maybe they think that they should be regarded as a global financial institution instead of a uh, uh, legal person and a small one in China. So I'm not sure if a, uh, Sergio agree with me that maybe uh, you are eager to have a bigger role in China, but the regulation framework is kind of uh, maybe more tailored to domestic players, but not for you. <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, I guess uh, if, if we look back into the last few years, I think there has been a, a huge amount of progress in, in opening up uh, 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 the markets uh, also for foreign institution and then uh, we had a good track record 12 years ago we were the first uh, bank to be allowed to manage uh, a local uh, securities uh, business uh, and uh, still by only owning a quarter of it and uh, we were the first uh, uh, international bank to be granted the license to control 51 percent and 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 so i can see that if you look at you know along from a longer uh, um, uh, time uh, standpoint of view, we had, a, a, you know, there has been good developments. Now, if you look fundamentally, um, you touched on a couple of points, but uh, most fundamentally, uh, uh, although Chinese financial markets are, is the third largest in the world in terms of size, and, you know, if you look at uh, the equity markets, uh, the bond markets, Market uh, the penetration and the diversification of uh, the participants in the market is, is still very uh, um, uh, skewed towards retail. In the equity market, 80% of that volume is retail. Yeah. And actually, it's very unlikely that you are always, you're ever going to have a foreign institution being able to capture a large size of business uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, domestic, uh, domestic pure business. At the end of the day, foreign institutions' scope and mandate, as, as far as we are concerned, is to do two things. First of all, helping these developments of the financial markets and the capital markets in China by bringing foreign investors into China and, over time, uh, taking Chinese investors outside China. So we have a very defined role from our strategic standpoint of view that we are not necessarily there to compete on pure domestic business uh, in areas where, uh, you know, scale mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and broader, uh, even potentially physical presence, particularly in the last few years, was necessary. Of course, now you could argue that through technology, you would be able to catch up. The truth of the matter is that there are already many incumbent, mm -hmm. sophisticated tech players that already took that market share. So as far as I'm concerned and UBS is concerned, we are really focused to help develop the capital markets in China by taking uh, uh, foreign investors into China and vice versa over time. And in that respect, uh, uh, I think that there is a lot of scope for, uh, for improving. Having said that, it's true that the fragmentation of legal entities that we have through the asset management, securities, wealth management, is not an efficient way for us to operate. And maybe there are ideas on how to streamline and allow us to use resources, financial resources, human resources, more horizontally, and being able to operate as a, as a group. Yeah, uh, I think it's, it's not easy for the uh, uh, chairman fund to uh, and make this kind of very good uh, regulatory framework for the uh, for the foreign institutions because the uh, CSRC, CBRC, and C CB and C CBIRC, and also the SAFE and PBOC. So all the uh, regulators and the central banks are involved in. So how would you coordinate with other regulators to uh, shut to shape a more uh, friendly, more fair uh, playing of the? of the field for the, insta um, for uh, the foreign uh, institutions. You know, re regulation certainly evolves, right? And as we welcome more foreign players like UBS into our market, and as more foreign institutional investors invest into the Chinese market, uh, regulation will have to adapt. And uh, uh, we have constant consultations with uh, you know, foreign uh, firms, and uh, their concerns are, are valid, uh, but uh, uh, you know, changes always come uh, gradually, right? Yeah. And uh, so on one hand, I think uh, 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 in our regulation will adapt, it will change. On the other hand, 
uh, it will um, it will evolve gradually. Yeah, I think a lot of improvements have been made. Yeah. So maybe one point: if you look at our activities in the U.S., we are active through an intermediate holding company, and we are regulated in the U.S. by the Fed, the OCC, FDIC, the SEC, just to name four. So at the end of the day, I don't think that there is any issue for a global group to be regulated by multi-regulators mm -hmm. in the same country, as long as we have a clear coordination and defined business model. Yeah, I think Chairman Fang is absolutely right that the uh, regulation is very important, but the uh, market player is even more important. So uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Zhang Yichen, as a uh, uh, leader for the uh, domestic financial institutions, uh, do you think you are capable enough to compete with the uh, international players, because we are, uh, we are saying that the, the wolf is coming. Wolf is coming for two decades. Do you think this time is a real? They are coming. Uh, I'm not competing with them. <laughs> uh, in fact, Sergio and I are gonna catch up right after because uh, uh, we're actually their customer. So yeah. anyway, but you we are, are in the investment of, business of, yeah. fundamentally, especially in uh, alternative investment. Uh, mainly in private equity. So a vibrant domestic capital market is instrumental to our business in two ways. One is clearly it's the exit for our investments. Second, in many cases, if it's a well-functioning market, then there should be opportunities to buy companies, to privatize as well. We have done that in many other markets in the world, in the US, in Hong Kong. And we certainly have listed companies as well. We invested our portfolio companies uh, on the Asia. So from our perspective, we have a, a very close sort of a hands-on experience in terms of uh, the pros and cons of various markets. And uh, I agree with Sergio that the, uh, over the last couple of years, we see clear progress uh, in China, uh, mainly in the form of uh, I think there's more transparency. Uh, there's more, uh, in terms of a, a more stricter enforcement of the rules. And uh, last but not least is the institutionalization, which I think the regulators have been advocating for a long time. But I think finally, I think after re retail investors suffered through the market downturns, may throw in the towel and then start buying funds instead. But one thing we have now seen is actually leveraging on the Asian market to find deals because uh, there are very few uh, companies that you know, can be delisted. At the end of the day, uh, having a listed vehicle is such a coveted resource in China and very few people want to give it up. Yeah. Let me uh, uh, add on what you know, Yi Cheng and Sergio have just said about uh, 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 who are the real players in the Chinese uh, capital market? Uh, the Chinese capital market, particularly the stock market, right, used to be you know, dominated by retail investors. Right? And by Ethan just mentioned that actually uh, things are changing. Right? And uh, you know, I have a few numbers. So at the end of last year, uh, institutional investors' market cap in the Chinese stock market was 20.6%. And it went up from 17.5% at the end of 2018, an increase of 18%. And among these institutional investors who increased their China investment most is the following institutional investors who came in through the two connects as well as the QFI and the RQFI. So their market cap was 3.1% at the end of 2018, but it went up to 4.2% at the end of uh, 2019, an increase of 35%. And as, as a result of these change, you know, the Chinese uh, stock market has become a lot more uh, institutionally determined uh, market. And pricing, in my view, has become also more efficient. So for example, last year, you know, the overall market index, the Shanghai Composite Index, went up by 22%. Right? And the MSCI stocks right, uh, went up by 44.8%. Now, we have a very interesting index in China, which tracks uh, the price of these 
not so good stocks. You know, we, we put an ST on them, right? Yeah. So some of them, you know, may have incurred a loss. Some of them may not have uh, uh, performed well in terms of information disclosure and so forth. So these kind of problematic stocks, they also have an index. That index declined by 14%. So that's exactly what it should be, right? Now, in a retail-dominated market, that may not be the case, right? The ST stocks also went up, you know, when the entire market uh, goes up. So this is a very positive development in the Chinese stock market, which means that the stock market going forward you know, will become a lot more resilient in the sense that it will be able to withstand external and internal shocks, right? Because institutional investors have a much better view about the stock that they invest in, and they will not be so jittery, right? And the market will also become a lot more vibrant in the sense that there will be you know, a lot more IPOs. Uh, the market can take up uh, these IPOs without uh, problems. And uh, uh, Yitzhak mentioned the value of a listed vehicle, right? Um, the value of a, just a listed vehicle should not be very high. <laughs> And uh, I, so it I think it used to be like uh, around three billion RMB per uh, vehicle, which is, so. which is obviously quite ridiculous. That's right? right. And I think going forward, you know, the market will be a lot more rational in terms of pricing a vehicle uh, as well. So, so overall, you know, I just want this group to know that you know, the Chinese stock market is undergoing some very positive change, and uh, the size is really, very big. So the quality is also rising. And uh, it should be a big place uh, for institutional, uh, particularly foreign institutional investors, to make investment in. Yeah, I think the uh, more positive and healthy uh, changes brought by the uh, uh, international uh, financial institutions to China uh, will will uh, will continue to come. If we look at the data, uh, 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 Chairman Fang mentioned four percent of the uh, uh, China's uh, security 4. market cap. Yeah. yeah, but actually, if we look at the uh, uh, all the tradable shares, then it's eight percent, which is even higher. Okay. So we are very optimistic that they will bring more a kind of positive culture and the. Uh, uh, the new style of the uh, value investment for the market, a lot of new things. But we will uh, touch on that, deep, uh, touch deeper on that a little later. And now I think that we should uh, uh, go to Professor uh, Carmen Reinhardt. And Professor actually published a very, very interesting uh, paper uh, in NBER, working paper on China's role in the global financial markets. And also, you're right, that is a, a two-way traffic. China's uh, go out to the global financial market, also global financial market uh, come into China. So how do you look at China's role in a big picture? And how do you look at the uh, China can continue to speed up the uh, role of the RMB uh, in the rest of the world uh, down the road? So let me go back also to your uh, initial question of why after a you know, number of years talking about uh, the desire of bringing in more foreign ownership, the numbers are still low. Uh, the starting point has to be currency convertibility. Yeah, it's a big uh, thing. That, that, you know, for, we, we can talk about, you know, changing investor participation, more integration domestically, uh, simplifying the rules of, of, you know, regulatory, but in the end also currency convertibility is, is critical. Uh, it's not important, it's, it's, it's very important for foreign participation to know that you can get out. Uh, and so I, that's sort of a, a general point, but going back to, to the other point that you made about uh, the work that I've done on China's role in capital markets. Let me first highlight that that role, I think, is under, way underestimated. Uh, there's a, you know, no end in the discussion and in the literature on China's large footprint on trade, but not really that much on China's large global footprint in finance. Uh, now, I would note that the global footprint in finance is primarily and almost exclusively official, meaning it is outward 
uh, flows, uh, and they're largely outward official flows. And these began with China's growth surge. Uh, they began in earnest in the early 2000s. This is foreign asset purchases. They're, you know, China being at one point, no longer, I think it's Japan is now the largest holdest, holder of US Treasury securities, but for a very long well, period of time, China. China had the record. And then, of course, China's external lending to well over 100 countries, mostly developing countries, but now increasingly in the more recent period also, Europe. Uh, so uh, two points about that. Uh, we haven't seen perhaps as much change as one might have expected in inward flows, but we've certainly seen huge changes in the last 20 years in outward flows, uh, both in terms of asset purchases, again, official PBOC, and uh, direct lending to emerging markets. This is not just an African phenomenon, it's really global. Um, I would note, however, that, and perhaps the members of this panel can clarify this, my reading of the internationalization efforts is that it's been far from constant. That in the period of very rapid growth, when China had double digit growth, when the PBOC was accumulating reserves and large inflows, there was a big push to have, uh, 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 to speed up the internationalization of the renminbi. And that that came to a screeching halt in 2015 as the economy began to slow down, yeah. uh, inflows became outflows, and capital controls at, by the end of 2015 were not lifted, they were strengthened. And these were controls on outflows. So um, I think we may be now, and this is conjectural, but I think we may be now on the cusp of another quickening, you know, with the trade agreement I think importantly also with the uh, more general perception that the global markets and investors have absorbed the message that growth is no longer averaging over 10%, but that is more likely to average 6%, that that transition uh, you know, was made and that China is really looking now to possibly reactivating the, the, the speed at which it opened capital markets. But I also want to hit on points that have been raised about regulation and in the uh, internal markets. I think given the size of China's economies, we're really discussing two things. One is we're discussing how Chinese capital markets can become more efficient, can become more developed, and so on. But I think also behind that and with that is how does China's, how do China's markets take a lead possibly becoming, given the size of its economy, another global uh, reserve currency? Yeah. Uh, and apart from the remark that I've already made on the need for convertibility, I think uh, what makes or breaks, and we can go back to this time permitting, uh, whether a, a country or a currency succeeds as a reserve currency is having uh, a well-integrated, highly liquid uh, domestic debt market. Um, and I think China, I would love to hear how China is moving uh, towards having, it certainly has the scale for a very impactful global domestic debt market a la US treasuries, um, which has been a setback for the euro, which, you know, you have one, you know, you have one currency, but many debt markets in Europe. Um, but I think we're really, in this discussion, I've been talking about two things. One is the development of the, the capital market just to you know, make it more efficient, make it more international. But the other is really to 
does it go beyond that to, to uh, reserve currency status? Yeah, thank you, Professor. Just we uh, push uh, uh, China's opening up of the uh, uh, capital market into more broader uh, kind of the landscape. The bond market in China is so important, and also internationalization of the yuan is important, and also convertibility of the capital account is also important. So uh, maybe we can touch on uh, them one by one if we have enough time. So uh, first to uh, Sergio, um, if you have business in China and you have a, a, a parent's company uh, in Europe and sometimes you need to uh, cross-border capital flows and you will face some kind of the, uh, uh, difficulties. So how do you see the urgency for China to have uh, maybe uh, push a little further in terms of capital count and to nurture you to have a bigger role in China and also make China's capital market, including bond market, also uh, uh, equity market, is more uh, open and more resilient and also more integrated into the global financial markets. Yeah, well, first of all, let me tell you that if I look back in the last few years and as of today, we never really uh, faced a situation in which we or our clients were not able to uh, 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 take out any investments from China. So I think it's the discussion is all about because the limits that we have right now are sufficient to accommodate today business. The discussion has to be about what do you expect going forward and if there is a time in which limits per se need to disappear because uh, they are no longer uh, complying with uh, a uh, free spirit of, of convertibility because there is a limit and a limit is always something that psychologically is going to impair uh, the situation. Now, if I can touch about uh, a very important point, even if you look at the situation as of today, as I mentioned before, China has the third largest equity market and the third largest bond market in the world. The situation, although is very similar to Europe in that respect. Because if you look at how the economy is funded, 70% of the economy is funded through, in the credit process through banks, like in Europe. While if you look at the US, in the US you have only 30% through the banking system and the rest of capital markets. So the real opportunity for China is twofold. I believe having a more diversified access to finance, uh, 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 to credit or to financing in each part of the capital structure. It's the only way to really uh, make yourself agile and more flexible uh, going forward and to be attractive for both um, um, in, uh, domestic and international investors. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if, you, if you do that, you also create less dependence on the banking system. And, 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 and in, yeah. in, in a sense, uh, you, you, you can... Uh, you, you can take adv advantage of, of that. So in a nutshell, I, I think that there is an opportunity for China to make sure that it doesn't repeat the problems and the, and the errors of Europe of not creating a broader and more comprehensive capital market infrastructure uh, to fund the future growth. And, and, you know, of course, we saw a higher... Uh, penetration of institutional investors coming into the market, many of them foreign, because of the inclusion on the MSCI, mm -hmm. right? Which was a, a meaningful uh, movement. But there is a point in time in which institutional investor in China needs to be able to go more outside through a higher Q QDII quota mm -hmm. and, and so that, and that the inflows provide, are compensated. more business for your company. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, let me just add on, on this internationalization uh, question. I think um, uh, China has adopted you know, a clear policy to make the IMB um, more internationally used, right? and at some point it will become one of the reserve currencies in the world. But that takes a lot of work. Right? So you mentioned you know, the capital account convertibility. You mentioned that China needs a large and liquid capital market, particularly the bond market, and these markets have to be you know, unified, open to international investors and so forth. But these things are not going to come together in a very short period of time. So it's all natural, the internationalization sometimes goes 
a little bit faster. Sometimes you know, it goes a little bit slower, right? And in all this process, you know, one overriding concern for China is that we want to make the entire financial system stable, make it right. So you don't want to create, you know, unnecessary risks in the process of internationalization. And, uh, uh, and in any case, without a very uh, large, you know, unified, liquid, and open capital markets, the RMB will never be a real international currency, right? So, so the, the first step, you know, in my view, is that let's, let's concentrate on making this capital markets, including bond and equity market, you know, large, vibrant, and open. And then when that infrastructure, almost like the infrastructure is there, the, uh, the pace of RMB internationalization will quicken. But let, let me say that uh, actually, to me, the slowdown mm. in two, from 2015 okay. made sense. Yeah. You actually, the time to aggressively pursue capital account opening is not when you have the potential for, for capital outflows. It's when you're getting inflows. Okay. Uh, so you open up in good time, in, in the best of times, when things are, are more likely uh, to, to, to not trigger uh, an overshooting and end up with more capital outflows uh, as a consequence. So the, 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 the quickening or the pace of liberalization is, is I understand that. Uh, I would like to point out, though, that another dimension that, and, and this is more iffy, right? I mean, what is private and what is public? Mm -hmm. um, it, in, in China, I noted that, I mean, ch the, the, the uh, amount of China's lending outstanding to the rest of the world, it's about 6% of, of global GDP. That's very substantial. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's largely official. Uh, so the yeah. part that... According to your, uh, that very good paper, it is very clear that the uh, public... Uh, Public money actually from the uh, uh, from sure. the uh, 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 import and export uh, bank and also for the uh, uh, exactly. uh, China uh, Development Bank and it's kind of uh, it's it's not a real public money it's kind of mixture development money so it is mm -hmm. uh, um, it is very difficult to define what is the public and what is private but uh, put them together uh, what is your suggestion for China to um, have this kind of investment in the uh, emerging market, especially in the one belt, one road. Uh, do you think that more transparency is needed and also maybe more viability of the uh, commercial lending is more important? Or China uh, model is still has some, uh, uh, some good reason there, good rationale there in your view? I, I think it may be too early to tell, but what I'm sensing is, look, uh, in terms of uh, China's lending to the rest of the world. As I said, it really began with the central bank, the PBOC, buying foreign securities. That, that was the first, so it was a, very much a portfolio, an official portfolio flow. Then it expanded to development lending uh, and trade finance to yeah. mostly low-income countries, but in recent years, we've seen it moving more and more towards middle income and more recently uh, to high income. And I think that is where we're seeing more joint ventures between, or at least a bigger blurring between what is official lending and what is private lending. I think the private sector uh, is playing a bigger, a bigger role, role in lending to Europe. Yeah, uh, which is so, good. So it's good what sign. I'm saying is, is that that may be it may be too early to say, but I think that is organically happening already. Yeah, I think it's very important, a lot of the issues we need to touch upon, but still uh, we don't have enough time. But uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Zhang, uh, maybe you want to talk a little bit on the uh, uh, currency RMB uh, convertibility in terms of the uh, China's capital uh, capital market opening up because you are based in Hong Kong and you can have a very good sense of that, how uh, important the convertibility of the currency of RMB uh, if it can play a bigger role in the rest of the world. And also Hong Kong is a good bridge there, but still, yeah. Uh, we manage both RMB funds and uh, dollar funds. So 
uh, for us, given the investment we actually make, it's counted as foreign direct investment, as FDI. So that is totally, there's no limit to it. So, we, and we have never encountered any trouble in terms of uh, expatriating the capital, like, you know, Sergio pointed out. So I, I, I do agree with, I think the general direction is for RMB to become more international, but at the end of the day, you cannot rush the process. I actually believe, uh, you know, I think Carmen pointed out, it was largely driven by capital flow, the initial sort of foray. Uh, and uh, uh, at the end of the day, I think in order for internationalization of RMB to stick, uh, instead of a, you know, two steps forward and one step back, it's fundamentally there has to be real usage, you know, real demand for RMB. And we are still f quite far from that. And the second, even in terms of uh, the overall structure of the capital markets, you know, Shirch pointed out that the, uh, uh, you know, China's at this point is more based on the European or Japanese model it's a bank-dominated uh, uh, financial system. In fact, you know, China's even more. China, we are actually talking about 90% of financial wow. asset is in banks. And clearly, it's a stated goal of the government for, as far as I know, I, I think it's, almost, it's at least almost 18, 17 or 18 years, since 1993, that this has been talked about you know, change, you know, shifting from a bank dominated or sort of an indirect finance uh, capital to a, a direct finance sort of a capital market. And uh, I think the, the, the issue is that clearly China has not made a lot of progress on that front, largely because I think it's just much more comfortable with the banking system because it's at government direction. I mean, the, the issue you pointed out about you know, all the overseas lending tends to be public funded because it's very natural. You look at all the, the banks in China, I mean, they're all right. owned, you know, <laughs> by the government or various levels of government. So, so that, I, I think China clearly needs to make headways on that front. The ultimate model is, is it going to be more like the U.S.? I actually have doubts because uh, more capital market dominated financial system does not actually mean it's better. You clearly, there's a, there's a, you need to strike a balance because uh, more capital market dominated tends to be uh, unstable, but at the same time, it adjusts very quickly. So the same reason you don't see Japan, you know, fall into a deep financial crisis despite all of the, uh, you know, stagnation for two decades, mostly because it's a bank dominated system. Now, there's a pros and cons to each side. That may be also why they have a stagnation for... Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I, I, but, you know, but the, the, the issue is, can you afford that sort of a downturn? In the case of Japan, they can because of social harmony and the, the you know, general sort of a, a lack of a, a wealth polarization. The U.S., you know, clearly went through a, a financial crisis and ended up with a lot of political problems. China cannot afford a deep downturn. So, yeah. you know, that's yeah. the just, justification tomorrow, for it. Yeah, two models are very interesting. Uh, thank you for uh, Yichen mentioning on that. Uh, one is the Anglo-Saxon model, which a capital market play a bigger role. And another is kind of a, a continental model and also including Japan and Korea and China, which banking sector play a bigger role. And the, uh, the former one, Anglo-Saxon model, needs a, a very good a, a legal system, common law system. And for the uh, continent, it's uh, another uh, system of the law. So I think that the two models uh, has the uh, historical origins, but still has some pros and cons. I think uh, Yi Chen and also uh, Sergio is absolutely right. So the question is for Chairman uh, Fang. Do you think how China can strike the balance between yeah. the two models? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no matter how you view it, uh, China needs a bigger capital market, right? Sure. Capital markets like right now is just uh, uh, you know too small, and in terms of providing financing for the economy, uh, the capital markets, as Ethan pointed out, perhaps only provides ten percent of financing right now. So whatever you know the advantage or disadvantage that the two models have, uh, the direction for China at this point is very clear that you know, direct financing, what we call direct financing, uh, has to be bigger than it is today. 
Yeah, particularly think... equity-based direct financing should be a whole lot bigger than it is today. Yeah, very quickly. I, I have to make this observation. I, I don't think there's any conclusive evidence to suggest that a larger capital market is either, produ you know, produces more crises or deeper ones. Mm. Uh, if we look at the rate of recovery from the 2008-2009 crisis, mm -hmm. uh, the average number of years it's taken Europe to recover lost GDP is approximately twice what it was for the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, I, I wouldn't push the I, idea. I, I'm not disagreeing yeah, yeah. with you. You are definitely the leading expert. <laughs> I read yeah. your book on that. But the yeah. thing is, I think about the social stability point, mm. which is how, when, when you have a deep drop, as a developing country like China, with so many other social problems, can you afford it? Mm. That is the issue. I'm not talking about the ideal structure of the uh, yeah, uh, I think we need a, yeah, I think we need another uh, two or three hours to mm -hmm. debate and discuss on China's future capital mm -hmm. market and all the trends and problems and issues. But uh, we have to wrap up now. So I would like to wrap up by uh, asking our panelists uh, a final question. Uh, in your view, uh, what is the, uh, uh, the best news in China's capital market in 2020? And also, what would be the uh, Black Swan event in China's capital market in 2020? Maybe uh, from Sergio first. Well, first of all, we already have a good development. Uh, uh, you know, personally, I don't believe that you need to be 100% owner in order to you know, drive the business. But uh, the fact that uh, on April 1st, we're going to go through officially another phase of, of uh, uh, the ownership structure is a very good news. Uh, the great news will be, as I mentioned before, if, we are, uh, if foreign firms are allowed to uh, act uh, more in, a, in a more coordinated way within the same uh, legal entity uh, uh, ownership uh, uh, framework. So, um, Maybe more ambitious? No, uh, I, 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 think, <laughs> I, I think that the reason is what one has to do step by step. And so I think that uh, we, uh, we need to be able to continue to invest uh, in a sustainable way and, and, and balancing future uh, growth with the, uh, the need also to see some uh, uh, economic uh, benefits. The, the black swan, I, I personally think that it can only be not necessarily a Chinese uh, black swan. I, I, I believe it's more a geopolitical um, uh, event that uh, drives uh, maybe um, uh, an acceleration of, uh, of uh, a slowdown in the global economy. And then in that sense, you could see maybe uh, uh, um, uh, uh, these developments of opening up of, of, of the markets in the globe, but particularly in China, slowing down. Yeah, but for the black swan, the possibility is very low, so it's still okay. But, but you asked me yeah. for a black swan. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly, Chairman. Uh, uh, as a regulator, obviously, you know, I watch out for black swan events, um, but I cannot say anything about it. Uh, I agree. The good news that I expect from the capital market is that uh, uh, you know, if the market becomes even more driven by institutional investors, if you know, both domestic and foreign institutional investors uh, started to play a bigger role right, in you know, determining the price, in trading, and in driving corporate governance uh, as well, that would be uh, the good news that I'm looking for. Yeah, thank you. Professor? Uh, I think, barring the new health threats, uh, the year started, you know, on a pretty upbeat note in terms of renewed stability towards higher growth and so on. So that, 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 that's a good setting for capital market, uh, uh, you know, capital market performance for uh, uh, financial uh, moving forward on a financial agenda. In terms of black swan, I have to bring up Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that is, you know, the big unknown. Yeah, but Hong Kong situation is improving. Yeah. The trend is good. Mr. Zhang? Uh, sure. In terms of uh, capital markets uh, in China, I think we are uh, cautiously optimistic this year, mostly because I think it uh, was the deleveraging of the last three years. Uh, the results have been uh, mixed. There are some you know, positive achievement, but by and large, uh, leverage did not really go down by that much. Fundamentally, it has to do with you have 
the companies, the the the, the microeconomic entities, the, the, that's you know with, with the vitality that, that can generate cash flow. That's the fundamental way to deleverage. And and uh, now that capital markets is more transparent and the uh, institutional investors tend to focus on value, that would encourage companies to focus on their bottom line, improve their ROE, and fundamentally that would be the right way to deleverage by improving cash flow. Yeah, thank you very much. We're looking forward to more uh, good news down the road in China's capital market. And also, uh, obviously, we are well prepared for the Black Swan event. And eventually, the Black Swan event will not come at all. OK, thank you. Please join me with a big applaud for our panelists. And thank you so much. <laughs>